appreciate it. So hopefully we'll get some other people to come in. But um, I want to thank you for coming out and taking your lunch break to spend uh, some time with me talking about uh, my suggestions and tips for seeing and visiting Yellowstone. Uh, I want this to be interactive. And if you have questions throughout, you're more than welcome to, to ask me those. So uh, just raise your hand and we uh, I'll uh, take your questions. So to get started, um, for those that don't know me, I think there's most of you in here that do know me, but um, I am, as Linda said, with the Hazardous Waste and Toxics Reduction Program. I'm the new unit soup for the uh, Reducing Toxics Threat Program. And I've been with Ecology for about three years. Um, but prior to, well, that's kind of my day job. What I tell people also, uh, I have a night job where I serve as the Deputy Mayor of Covington, Washington. Um, so I sit on the City Council and I've been doing that for about a year and a half. Prior to that, though, I worked for a number of nonprofits that their primary mission was to help preserve and protect national parks. I did that for about 15 years. Uh, I was a lobbyist uh, for both of them and spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. and out in the field in national parks uh, working to get more money for them, more resources, and, and pass legislation. And then prior to that, um, I actually was a park ranger uh, for about five seasons. Uh, this is me at Yellowstone. Um, uh, I don't know if I've weathered that well uh, since then, but um, uh, I spent a lot of time in Yellowstone, and I'm going to talk about some of my uh, tips and secrets to seeing Yellowstone. So, oh, one other thing, a uh, little background. Um, I grew up going to national parks. Um, my parents made it a priority to take my brother and I to national parks just about every summer. Uh, and my dad was in the Army, so we moved about every two years when I was growing up uh, from, I was born in Texas, we moved all uh, every two years until we finished up in Alaska. And as I said, we spent basically every summer out in the national parks, and my parents thought it's their duty to introduce their two boys to um, the natural wonders of America, but also its history. So we went from Denali to the Everglades to um, Boston to California to see national parks. Uh, what I tell people is, and I told my parents is, I didn't always enjoy those trips. Uh, in fact, I thought we were being dragged quite often to these places that were a little more than boring scenery and dusty old buildings. Um, but something happened uh, over the years as I visited those parks. The, the gift that national parks are slowly dawned on me, and now. Uh, in my work, um, especially the work I do, uh, which you're going to hear about in a little bit, uh, I see it as my duty to help preserve and protect those places for future generations. So I take my kids now to national parks. This is Yellowstone. We just went this last summer, uh, and I actually am fighting for the right to inflict upon my kids what was <laughs> inflicted upon me. So that's kind of what drives me. So. So, as I said, what do I do now? Just for those that don't know, uh, I do write op-eds about national parks. I've lobbied federal uh, officials on national parks, but I also spend a lot of time writing novels. Uh, these are my three books. The uh, first one was Unleashing Coulter's Hell, then I wrote Lost, Lost Cause, uh, and then mo one that's coming out in December is Need to Know, and they're all based in national parks. Uh, Need to Know is set at Mount Rainier, and like I said, should come out in December. So to get oriented to uh, Yellowstone, I like to set some context and, and not assume that everyone knows where we are when we talk about it. So this is the continental United States, obviously, and Yellowstone is right here in the northwest corner of Wyoming with a little tiny bit um, spilling over into Montana and Idaho. Here's a blow up of that. The Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is about 13 million acres, uh, and that comprised of national forest land, fish and wildlife land, some BLM, and the core national park. And one of the things I like to ask people is, you know, why do you think Congress drew the line such that the park, if you see that dotted line, that's the boundary of Wyoming. Why didn't Congress just scoot the park over just a little bit and put the whole thing in Wyoming? So one state wouldn't own it. Mm, that's good. So we got to think about when this park was created. It was established in 1872. It was the world's first national park. 
and Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho did not exist at that time. So it was carved out of territory that later would become uh, states. And so that just so happens that they had those little tiny sections that were in Montana and Idaho. Um, but it is now people, Montana and Idaho, um, market Yellowstone as being part of their park or part of their states, even though 95% is in Wyoming. Uh, but it's helpful to understand kind of the uh, history and the geography. Again, as I said, Yellowstone is the world's first national park. Um, uh, explorers uh, from uh, Lewis and Clark on up had heard tales about Yellowstone, but they had never actually uh, visited it until the United States sent an expedition in 1872, and that's, or excuse me, 1871, and then the following year they passed legislation to create a national park. So we understand where we are, but why here? You know, Yellowstone is, is world known for its geysers and hot springs. Um, and scientists are just now starting to figure out why is the world's collection, two thirds of all geysers and hot springs can be found in Yellowstone National Park. Well, why? Um, why aren't they spread more equally around the world? Um, in order to understand that, we have to know a little bit about the Earth's geography and plate tectonics. The Earth's surface, scientists tell us, is a lot like that of a cracked egg. Uh, it's broken up into a number of plates, and those plates bump up against each other in several places. And where they bump up, they move. Uh, the Earth's surface, uh, due to its um, uh, early creation, has latent heat inside it. That The Earth is still cooling down, but there's also radioactive processes that heat that rock inside and create currents that move that molten material up and down. And those plates basically float on that. And you see these black lines. Those are the larger plates where the Earth's surface has cracked. And those plates, because that molten material is actually swirling like the hot water in a uh, boiling pot, you see those little bubbles go up and down? That's what we believe is happening down in the Earth as well. Well, it pushes those plates like on conveyor belts. And in some places, those plates do what's called a, make a normal fault fault, they'll pull apart from each other. In other cases, they slip past each other, what's called a slip fault. And then in others, we have what's called a reverse fault, where one will dive down under the other. Well, in all those instances, when you create that space or crack, that allows some of that molten material to move up to the surface. Uh, and we're going to take a look at that here shortly. So. This map looks very similar to the one we just saw, but this is an illustration of all the world's active volcanoes. And what you notice right away is those active volcanoes tend to correlate or coincide where those plates are, don't they? So there's good indication that plates and plate tectonics have a significant impact upon the formation of volcanoes. And this section around the Pacific, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, is called the Ring of Fire. And those are primarily subduction zones. So the Pacific plate is diving down underneath those larger and uh, lighter continental plates. And as they sink down, they get heated up in the Earth's uh, core. And what happens to warm materials? If we had a, a warm balloon in this room, a hot air balloon, where does it go? Goes up, exactly. So what do you think happens to molten rock? It goes up because it's lighter and it goes to the surface and looks for cracks and spots and weak areas where it can get to the surface of the Earth. And that's what these dots re represent, triangles. That's where volcanoes, where molten material has made itself to the, made its way to the surface. This is a map of the Western United States. And as I said, it coincides very closely to what we see on the larger map of where we see lo uh, volcanoes located in the United States. But in some rare instances, and science doesn't totally understand some volcanoes are not related to known plates. They form, like Yellowstone and the Hawaiian Islands, over what we suspect are hot spots. So in Yellowstone, science has determined that there is a hot spot under there that actually is, um, so let me back up. The crust that we normally walk on, like here, is anywhere from 20 to 60 miles thick. Where we see these hot spots, though, the crust is very thin very weak, and it allows that molten material to get ever closer to the surface. Uh, in Yellowstone, it's estimated that the crust there is only about three miles thick, about a three-minute drive by car. 
And that's all that separates us from the molten material that's underneath the earth and under Yellowstone National Park. Well, how do we know it's a volcano? And do, how do we know if it, um, it's going to erupt in the future? Well, as I said, there's evidence that that plate that we're on is moving slowly to the west and riding up over the Pacific plate. Um, we can feel that in earthquakes, but there's also direct evidence in the land. If we look at the Yellowstone ecosystem, and this is going to hopefully do this little animation, the Earth's crust is moving in a westerly direction, and that hot spot that you saw is moving slowly underneath it, staying stationary as the crust itself moves. And about every 600,000 years, that volcano erupts, and then it'll move, and then it'll erupt. And if, as we move to the west into uh, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, we see evidence of past uh, craters, past eruptions. Uh, and as I said, the timing between those is about every 600,000 years, those eruptions. Does anyone care to guess when the last Yellowstone eruption was? 599. Yeah, about 600,000 years ago, so <laughs> we're due. But along with that, that crater evidence, there's actually the ashfall evidence as well. These, um, this map shows the uh, area of ash cloud deposits in the continental United States. And if you look up in the top left corner, that's the ash cloud deposits from Mount St. Helens in 1980. Was anyone here in Washington who interrupted? Yeah. It seemed pretty dramatic, didn't it? Um, I was in Spokane during that eruption, and it blacked out the sky. Um, we had a quarter inch of ash everywhere. Um, basically, the entire rest of the day was dark. And then it um, subsided, the cloud went on, the sun came back up, and we were on the, basically on the moon at that point. These ash clouds are hundreds of times bigger, and the ash deposits in some places are 10 to 12 yards deep. If Mount St. Hell, or excuse me, Yellowstone was to erupt like this in, uh, today, uh, we'd see worldwide ramifications from this. The entire uh, central United States would probably be buried under dozens of feet of ash, wiping out the um, crops in that area. We'd see s significant um, impacts upon aviation, travel, uh, water supplies. Uh, it's not something we'd want to see. So on that happy note, we're going to now turn and, and visit Yellowstone. Because even though we don't totally understand what is driving Yellowstone or what it holds in the future, people are drawn to it. They are inspired by its mystery and the things that we see there. So I'm going to make a few assumptions about our trip to Yellowstone. One, that you're likely to stay in the park, whether that's at a five-star hotel or camping in the uh, outback. Um, it's best in order to really see the park, to be inside the park in order to do that. You can stay outside, but it makes it a little more complicated to do that. I'm also going to assume you have a number of days to see the park as well. We're going to talk a little bit more, but Yellowstone is a very big place, and I'll tell you how big here in a second. Uh, and it's not something you can see in a day. Uh, I do ha did have a number of people driving through Yellowstone telling me, you know, how can I see Yellowstone in a day? And we'd basically say, you know, just keep driving and um, do the best you can. But I've spent um, months in Yellowstone and still can't say I've seen everything. It's just that big. Uh, I'm also going to assume that you have an automobile. Um, again, Yellowstone is very large. It was built in 1872 pri primarily for uh, wagon trains, but it is now designed for automobiles as well. And there's little, if any, public transportation in Yellowstone. We do see people hitchhike, and um, park visitors are very open to picking up hitchhikers, but it's not as predictable, um, and so most people come in automobiles. So those are three assumptions I'm going to make. So my first assumption or tip is to remember that Yellowstone is a big place. How big? So this is a map, again, of Yellowstone. Uh, its statistics are it's 2.2 million acres. Uh, that's kind of hard to get your mind around. How big a place is that? Well, Yellowstone is actually bigger than two states, uh, Rhode Island and Delaware combined. Uh, and so, again, would you go to Rhode Island or Delaware and go to their capitals and say, "What? I'm here for a day, what can I see? That's how large Yellowstone is. Uh, but even that, sometimes it's hard to grasp. You know, if you've never been to Rhode Island or Delaware, you know, that's 
it's tough to get your mind around. Well, this spot here in the middle is Yellowstone Lake, uh, and it's the world's largest alpine lake. Uh, and this little thing you're going to see there, see this here? That's actually Seattle superimposed on top of Yellowstone Lake. So the lake alone is bigger than some of the places we've been and wouldn't likely say we could see in a day. So we're talking about a very large place. This here, you've probably seen this all before, is a typical aviation travel map. Uh, and they, well, why does um, airlines draw maps like this? Why don't they have routes that go from, say, like this, Seattle, all the way to Atlanta or Minneapolis? What are some thoughts on why they draw this, what's called a spoke approach? Hub. Yeah, so what, what, what are they doing with that hub? Everyone. <clears throat> Well, the assumption is that the majority of the people will probably be going to the hub, but smaller conference of people are going to the outlying areas. Yes, and it's more efficient to do that, isn't it? You can start and say, if you're in Denver, you can get to all those places going back and forth. Um, you save time and energy traveling this way. That's an approach I encourage people to use when they go to Yellowstone. Again, it is a very large place. Now, you're free to stay anywhere you want, so you could conceivably stay at a place like Mammoth and be planning on visiting things, say, down at the south entrance. Uh, but that's an all-day drive to get there and come back. Uh, so what I tell people to do is pick central locations and plan trips from those locations. So go out. So if you're going to stay in the north, you know, you might want to stay at Mammoth and plan your visit up around in there. And then for the later part of your trip, move to another spot and see the lower parts of that. It saves time, saves energy. Uh, you're doing less driving, you're seeing more of the park. So these are some of the places that have both um, hotels and camping, but the other sites also have some camping in there as, as well. So you, you can do the same thing at just about any place in the park. But that's what I encourage people to do, is camp at one site, do day trips from there. If you're going to see another part, move to that part of the park. Uh, one of the other things I encourage people to do, and it probably makes sense is to just know a little bit about the park before you go. Uh, it is, as I said, very large. There's a lot in Yellowstone, just about something for everyone visiting this park. So it helps to kind of have some idea of how you want to tackle and, and visit Yellowstone before you go. Uh, places like the Old Faithful Lodge or the Lake Hotel, which we saw, um, those require reservations, and usually it takes about a year in advance to get a reservation at those hotels. They do have cancellations on occasion, but I wouldn't bet on that. So if you're thinking about going to Yellowstone next year, you want to get on that now. Uh, some of the campgrounds, those ones that I showed with um, the X's, they take reservations as well. Those tend to fill up very quickly, and they also tend to be the larger campgrounds as well. So if you're looking for a smaller more secluded place. They do have first come, first serve, but you got to get there early in the morning. People are already lining up as soon as the sun's coming up to see people that are coming out. So just be aware of that. There are backcountry sites as well. Uh, you'll have to go to the ranger station to get a permit to stay in those campsites. Oh, and this, this is just typical information. The Park Service website has a lot of this as well, and I'm sure you all know it's just nps.gov. So. Uh, and you can get to any national park from that site. For Yellowstone, it's a little tip, it's just Y-E-L-L. -L. Most national parks have a four-letter uh, uh, call sign for them. They tend to be the first three letter, four letters of their name, but in some cases, like Mount Rainier, it's the first two letters of Mount and the last, or the first two letters of Rainier. So more is how Mount Rainier is referred to in the National Park Service. So as I said, uh, Yellowstone being so large has something for just about everyone. Um, I often call it the most perfect park there is. It's almost a cliche. Uh, around every corner there's something new. And for being the world's first, it kind of set the bar very, very high on what people uh, expect and want from other national parks. Because again, anywhere you go, uh, it's basically different. So in the north, uh, and this is just a map showing where you might predominantly see wildlife, but the northern part of the park, uh, and I've got some pictures here. Ooh, I don't want that. Um, has some of these world famous um, uh, terraced hot springs. 
Uh, the elevation there is about 6,600 feet, so that's something people need to be aware of. It's, very, it's got some high elevation in Yellowstone. Ranges from, like I said, 6,600 to over 10,000 feet, with uh, elevations in some of these areas at Lake being around 7,700 feet. Um, but as you go from each of these places, the uh, wildlife changes, the features change, the topography, the um, ecology, all can change dramatically within a matter of a few miles. So um, you have incredible um, geyser features and vistas, but you also have, uh, say at West Yellowstone here, a typical frontier town, although it's now more of a tourist trap, um, but you have that opportunity as well to be in the front country and see some of those things uh, that maybe smaller kids or older adults want to see, but you also then can get into the back country and see things that you know the vast majority never see. You can get remote experiences, but you can also have experiences with hundreds of uh, thousands of other people as well. The east side um, is a different landscape uh, from the west side. We have uh, some open vistas and valleys like Hayden Valley here, which is uh, one of the best places to see grizzly bear and wolves. Uh, on my last trip, we actually saw both of those on the same day in the same spot. Uh, again, it was almost like it was planned for us. Um, so pretty amazing stuff. You have unbelievable canyons and waterfalls in Yellowstone, uh, world-class hotels, massive lakes, and geyser features of all kinds in this park. So again, something for just about everyone in Yellowstone. So like I said, I want you to know before you go to be have some a plan for how you're going to attack this park, although it is okay at times to just go out and see what's going to happen. Um, that's an acceptable plan as well. But if you do have expectations or you've got reservations, you need to be flexible. You need to add in uh, hours perhaps to get to your, your destination. So these are just a couple things that can throw monkey wrenches into your plan. So in the top left here, we've got the weather. The weather can change dramatically in Yellowstone uh, on a moment's notice. Big, huge thunderstorms, rain, snow just about any day, any time of the year. Um, I was there uh, in August working for the Park Service and it snowed significantly while I was working there. Uh, people don't often expect that. You leave from Miami, it's 80 degrees. You expect it to be in July, it's going to be 80 degrees in Yellowstone. Could be. Could also be snowing there too. So just need to be aware that that's a possibility. Uh, wildlife are unpredictable and they're not controlled short of um, making sure they're not getting into places where they're not supposed to or harming people but they're allowed to basically roam wherever they want and bison tend to uh, accommodate or, or travel at times on roads because it's easier for them especially in the winter time when those roads are, are plowed you'll see them walking right down the road like uh, everyone else and those bison uh, have become somewhat habituated to cars, so they're in no hurry to get out of the way. They'll spend lots of time in the roads, so you have to be prepared that you may be stuck in what are called bison jams or bear jams, uh, and that can slow your trip down. And then other things are unpredictable. This is a fire map uh, of Yellowstone, and it is a very large place, and it does have fires just about every, every year. When we were there this last summer, we had plans to go down to the Grand Tetons, which is just to the south. Uh, it doesn't show it on here, but in the southern entrance there was a fire that started right here and it closed the southern road. That, that's the only road to get to uh, Grand Teton unless you go all the way around for about six hours. It was closed and we could not go and it wasn't going to reopen while we were there. So we had to change our plans and just roll with it and go, we're going to do something else. Yeah? So Sean, you and I were actually there within a couple of weeks of each other mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. And just to speak to the weather, we had rain pouring but. Torrential downpour of rain, sunshine, and it missed snow within a half an hour right. on the same day in August. Right. And as you travel, that weather can change too. I mean, we would see the fires from up, we climbed Mount Washburn, which is over 10,000 feet, and you could see the fires in the distance. They didn't have any impact on what we were doing, but if we were heading that way, the roads were closed in other areas. So it, it's a just because they said there's fire in Yellowstone, you need to call and say, okay, is the fire in an area that's going to impact what I want to do? It may or may not. So uh, I didn't touch on it, but these distances um, uh, are about 12 miles, 12 to 15 miles between each one. If you look here, this, this circle here is road and up there is road. And when the park was created, most people accessed the park by um, uh, 
wagon, uh, what, what are they called, stagecoaches. And that distance between those points was about how far a stagecoach could go in a day. And so we created those um, visitor amenities at each of those spots. Well, now obviously we can drive much quicker and much faster, but even at that in an automobile, between those points, on average it takes 45 minutes to an hour. These are curvy roads, they're not meant for high speeds. Any number of people are driving on them at any time. So, you know, just because it says 15 miles between those, it's probably 45 minutes to an hour, just between those two sections. And then another 45 minutes. So to get down to the southern part of the park, from the north, two and a half hours, you know, even if you're going at a good speed. So again, it looks short on the map, but it's gonna be at least two to three hours driving there and coming back. So that's just something people underestimate when they go to Yellowstone. So again, plan, but be flexible. This may seem obvious, but for a number of people, they don't get out of their cars or they don't get very far from their cars. Um, we have what's called the 10% club. 10% of people don't get any more than, um, I think it's 100 yards from their car. And Yellowstone, as I told you, is 2.2 million acres. So there's a lot more than what you see from 100 yards from your vehicle. I understand that some people say they're coming from New York City. That's their first experience in, in uh, say, the, the wilderness, and it's scary for them to let go of that vehicle. And so if that's their, your first experience, that's okay. But if you've been several times, feel more comfortable, you want to get away from crowds, go 100, more than 100 yards from your car, and you're going to lose 90 to 95% of the people that go to national parks. And I've got a couple of places that are fairly easy to get to. They don't take a significant amount of hiking. That you know the crowds are going to be significantly less. This is called Lone Star Geyser. It's about a four-mile round-trip hike on a uh, old abandoned road that's open to bikes. That's another thing we get. Where can we do things like bike riding? There's some places in the park, so you want to ask at the visitor center if you're interested in those types of things. But this is an easy one. And it's fairly regular in its eruption, sending water, I think, 15 to 20 feet in the air about every three hours. And the Park Service does post predictions for that at the visitor center at Old Faithful. So you can time your hike out there, have lunch or eat an early dinner, watch the eruption, and hike your way back. Uh, this is another nice, fairly easy hike. This is Mystic Falls. It's about three miles, and it's in the upper geyser basin. You go by a couple of uh, really very um, uh, subtle geysers as you go out there. One I believe is called Jewel Geyser. It erupts about every 10 minutes and sends water 15 to 20 feet in the air as well. Uh, and so if you just missed it, you wait another 10 minutes, you're going to see it again. And very few people um, recognize that. And so they'll walk past and not see this little geyser erupt. But off the, that boardwalk, you can walk out to Mystic Falls. And this is probably a 75 to 100 foot falls. Uh, easy hike out there. Uh, they call it moderate, but it's, I wouldn't call it moderate. Um, you know, there's an opportunity to climb up on top of a ridge, it's another 500 foot climb, and you can see um, most of the upper uh, Geyser Basin Valley all the way to Old Faithful on the distance. So, and again, when we were on this, we saw probably 12, 15 people, and we could see the cars where there were hundreds of people down in the valley. So you're going to lose most people. And then I just mentioned Mount Washburn. This is a little more difficult. Uh, Park Service calls this strenuous. Uh, it's about a three mile hike, depending upon where you start, uh, 1400 foot climb. But you can see the top basically from the entire trail, so you can judge how much farther you have to go. This is, the, as I said, the highest point in Yellowstone, and you get a panoramic view of the entire park. You can see up to 60 miles away, and this is where we were able to see those fires all the way around the park and the smoke coming up. Um, but we were obviously uh, unaffected up on top of the up on top of this uh, mountain. You do need to be aware of the weather. Uh, it was very windy up there. It can be cold. Um, it can be exposed. So there are very few trees at the top there. So we want to check the weather, make sure there's no things like lightning storms or that sort of thing. So uh, these are just three little things that aren't. They're not hidden from people, but people just tend not to go to these things if it's not within 100 feet of the road. Most of the people miss these things. So. So here comes kind of the, the downside of the talk. Uh, national parks like Yellowstone are not controlled uh, amusement parks. These places are not Disneyland. People do and have been injured and killed in Yellowstone. Uh, the Park Service does do a fairly good job of balancing 
uh, people's expectations or their excitement against the concerns that they might have, the risk they're going to uh, confront. So things like staying on the trail, I know we hear that at other parks, but in Yellowstone it's very important, especially in those thermal feature areas, to stay on the trails because the ground can be very thin and Park Service has not mapped out all these thermal features, so it's possible and has happened where people step off the trail and break through the crust and end up in a boiling hot spring. So you just want to stay on those trails. Uh, as I also said, animals are not controlled in Yellowstone. And there's a wide variety of animals from you know, insects to large carnivores like grizzly bears. Uh, I'm going to tell you, um, you can, and people do see bears uh, and have been injured in the past, but you're more likely to get hit by a car than you are to be mauled by a bear. But you want to uh, lessen your chances of that happening. So when you're hiking, you want to hike in groups, you want to make noise. You obviously don't want to hike at night. Um, you want to just make your presence known. So it's just common, I think, courtesy. If we were visiting somebody else's house, we'd ring the doorbell before we walked in, wouldn't we? We'd want them, people to know we were coming in. Well, these are grizzly bears' homes, black bears, other animals, and it's always good to let them know that you're coming. Nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, the bear will be long gone before you come around the corner. So you just need to let them know. And as I said, the weather is very unpredictable in Yellowstone as well. Um, it can, at times, in summer, you know, 70 to 80 is very comfortable. Could also snow, as I said. The winter time, um, Yellowstone is often the coldest spot in the United States, um, 40, 50 below. So I tell people to come in the, winter, in the summertime to be prepared for any weather, and in the wintertime to be prepared for frigid cold. Um, so you just need to be aware of that. But mostly, I think I tell people that the greatest tip I can tell them or give them is to have fun. You know, come to Yellowstone with your sense of adventure, your sense of wonder, your willingness to see things differently and try new experiences. Um, this was a recent trip I took to Yellowstone, and one thing I noticed, yeah, there's crowds, but I also, uh, since the time I wore the flat hat, realized that people come to Yellowstone to feel connection to something lasting. Whether they're aware of it or not, they are all having a public experience with something that is greater than them. And that's what I think the power of Yellowstone is and the power of national parks. It allows us to connect to the people in the past that set these places aside, but also we have an obligation to protect it and pass it along to the future. And that's what you, um, I think the greatest tip you can have is go with that sense of wonder, go with your eyes open and have fun. So. <coughs> Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, and back up. Back up. Back up. Let's see if, see if I can. To the bear one? Yep. So. Okay, let's see. Here. All right, hold on. There you go. That so one? the bear spray thing, we were mm -hmm. hiking here and we really like to get off trail. But we paid a lot of attention to the fact that um, they're very serious about the signage, about staying on the path, and mm -hmm. they have pictures yeah. um, on the signs about what happens if you potentially could ever happen, and they're really, they get your attention. Mm -hmm. um, but we were hiking, and we noticed all of a sudden there was just the two of us on this trail. It was about a mile in, which completely happy, and we looked around each other, and we were up just the two of us. Mm -hmm. We're like, uh-oh. Yeah. Right? Because the bear spray thing was everywhere. And we looked at each other and thought, not worth it. Mm -hmm. Right? We went back to the main trail. Right. So I'm finding that get out of your car and go 100 yards off the trail it sounds great. And they were all about that bear spray. Mm -hmm. so I, should have, I, I should have mentioned that. That's something they encourage people to take as well. It sounds like it, it um, is a little bit of overkill, but all the park rangers carry that when they go in the backcountry, and it is effective. It does work. Um, like I said, nine times out of ten, if you're doing all those other things, hiking in groups, making noise, not hiking at night, um, um, those sorts of things, you'll be fine. But on the off chance that you do startle a bear, um, the bear spray has been shown to be effective in, in chasing them off.
One of the reasons we decided not to carry bear spray mm -hmm. was the bottle was fifty dollars. Yeah, it's expensive. And there was one place that you could rent it, mm -hmm. but it was um, on the far side of the park. Right. You know, like the far side, like a four-hour yeah. drive, the far side. And so we just decided to. And you, you, I've hiked without it as well, so. Yeah. so okay. But it's something they recommend and. We had it when we went, um, but I wouldn't do anything differently uh, with or without bear spray. I'd still make noise and hike with groups. And uh, Yellowstone, my experience, I, I did see bears, but it was more often from my car. Um, and I told some of you, um, there's a real easy way to identify uh, wildlife in Yellowstone. So you're driving along, you see um, cars parked on one side of the road. Um, it's probably bison, something like that. You see cars parked on both sides of the road, you know, maybe a herd of elk or something like that. If you see cars parked in the middle of the road with everyone out of their cars, that's probably bears. Um, and so uh, more often than not, I saw almost all the wildlife from my car. Uh, you just have to be um, open to seeing these things uh, by chance. Uh, but in some areas where that one map I showed you, there are areas where animals tend to predominantly be, and that Hayden Valley, I recommend it. Uh, that's a good place to go at dawn or dusk to see things like grizzly bears, bison, wolves, and you will see lots of people out there from a safe distance with spotting scopes, <coughs> which will allow you to see those animals too, so. Yeah. Other questions, yes? So if you wanna have like a winter Yellowstone mm -hmm. trip, um, are there certain hubs where the nearby stuff is still going to be accessible, yeah. like some of the really prismatic pools and things like that? Right, so Old Faithful um, has what's called Snow Lodge, so you can take, um, they still allow snowmobiles in, but they also have snow coaches, uh, mm -hmm. which I tend to recommend. They have less of an impact on the environment and wildlife. Uh, they're more environmentally friendly. Uh, one engine can take, you know, 25 people in. Um, so they have reservations there. All the guys are still working the wintertime. Uh, the animals are still out. You can get to you can cross country like ski. Uh, they do clear some of the uh, boardwalks, uh, but they have cross country ski trails, snowshoe trails. Uh, obviously, you can get to any place in the park you want to, uh, but you might have to hike 20 or 30 miles. Um, and again, the weather can be very unpredictable. But I took a winter snow coach trip in Yellowstone, and it's a totally different park than it is in the summertime. Crowds are one percentage of what they are in the summertime. Uh, the landscape is very dramatically different, and the contrast between that hot geysers and the cold snow is just really unbelievable. So most of those uh, features, though, you have to get reservations outside the park for those. So there's concessions that run the snow coaches and the snowmobiles, and they'll bring you in and then you can stay inside the park. Although people in the wintertime tend to stay sometimes outside the park because it's more of a day trip in than a day trip out. Because you can't get all the way through on snow coaches to say Grand Teton or others, so. Others? Let me, I have another question. Yeah. So, the boardwalks? Mm-hmm. So this is so hard to, um, you had a picture for the back, but you know. Um, so these boardwalks go over these geysers that are like boiling. Mm -hmm. And but okay. these geysers, some of them, the boardwalks are directly over the middle of these geysers. And these geysers or these these pools can be, you know, five hundred yards long. Right. And there's a boardwalk right over the top of it. Right. How on earth did they build Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. over the top yeah. of the boiling, you know. Right. So very carefully, I guess, um, you know. Yeah, so they had to be out there in those, those conditions. Yeah, um, many of those boardwalks aren't sunk deep into the ground. They're basically on those, um, what are they, those ceramic uh, tiles. So they aren't really digging them in. But yeah, they had to be incredibly careful. They would uh, carry most of those materials in, uh, either on wagons or um, animals, so they don't have vehicles to bring them in. Um, but. Yeah, they had to build them carefully, slowly, and they have to be maintained. That's one of the things I worry about in some of those is the railings they have. I think people put far too much trust in those railings, and they'll be leaning out over them. And um, I tended to just, you know, that's a suggestion that I not step over there um, as opposed to something that will always save my life. So um, it's just something to be aware of. They 
they do have to be maintained. So, yeah. All right. When's your new book come out? December. Um, and like I said, it's uh, located in Mount Rainier. And my books tend to tra draw on uh, real live events, things that have happened, and then I spin a story out of that. And so um, my first one was at Yellowstone. The next one was in Civil War Parks. This one's at Mount Rainier. And without giving too much away, I like to ask people, um, this one spins off of an artifact that's buried up on Mount Rainier and it's being discovered. And there's people that want to reveal it and there's other people that don't want to reveal it. And it's a race to get it and see who wins and what that means. So uh, like I said, it comes out in December. All my books are on Amazon, so you can find them there if you want. So, anyway, yay. Thank you.